um, you used the word fundamental religion, and I was thinking when, when you gave the, the uh, subject, I thought, ah, fundamental, does it mean fundamental or fundamentalist? And, and someone said, oh, I want to go to that lecture because I'm so interested in how to deal with fundamental, fundamentalism. So, and fundamentalism in itself is a very diff difficult concept and also Christian origins. So just, do you mean the same thing or can you have fundamental religion without being a fundamentalist? Fundamentalist. I, I don't know. I, I think that, that's why I said I don't know if I'm fundamental. I believe in, you know, it, I believe that we in Judaism have some fundamentals, dogmas, not very many, a few, and then the rest is really up for discussions, except for what is practice. Also that, some people, of some, I've heard about some people who don't necessarily practice everything, but uh, heard about it. <laughs> and uh, but what is fundamental? Some say that it's taking things, the words, the fundamentals, uh, by its meaning. In, in Judaism, I also don't know what, we, we talked about Paideo, we studied the text today, and I say how you read it, how you could read this word then, and how you read it today, puts it in this context, in this context. Every religion, this is what's been exciting for me in this passage, because I, I, I know quite well the development of, especially of Jewish law, more than this is something which interests me, the, the, the thinking of how Jewish law uh, develops and develops. And, and I've learned so many details from the big Islamic uh, lawmakers, and in many very ways, very parallel, not exactly, again, not at all symmetrical, but it's been fascinating to go into the details intrinsic. Some of these things we're going to do together, for example, we're building now a bank together in Israel, uh, which will be a Jewish Muslim bank. Uh, but one of the ideas of this bank is that we won't take interest from people, only the expenses, but no, no interest, because this is a joint concept in Judaism. Islam, you know, have to take interest. But we're doing many, many other things together. In, in Europe, we're working together with the, the biggest Muslim organization. And, but these are built on fundamentals, on, on, on religious fundamentals. And, and you know, in Judaism, we have the oral laws, uh, we have the, the Hadith in, in, in Islam. And, and it's, it's uh, the Christianity has its own way of interpretation, which again is is very different from, from, from Judaism and Islam. I don't know. I'm using just the concept which is generally accepted in society. I'm not going to go into a definition exactly who is the fundamentalist. But the ones in the world who are looked at as at the fundamentalists, the radicals, those are the ones I deal with. Usually I sit with people in the, in the, amongst the Muslims, if they haven't been in prison for a certain amount of years for terror, then they can't be a part of our coalition. Mm -hmm. This is a precondition to be in our coalition. So it's, uh, you know, and there's one of the people, once we met a, a, a big leader in Europe, and they said, well, then how can you be in the, how can I be in the coalition? Because I haven't spent so much time in prison, only visiting people in prison. <laughs> And they, I said, well, I'm allowed to carry the suitcases. This is what my, my job is. Uh, I don't fit into this. Uh, but it's not meant for people. Me, I, I don't have to be convinced that the peace and democracy and so on is the right way. But, but it's interesting. It, it's interestingly easy. And, and really, it's the really most, most radical people. People have been sitting years and years and this has been their life belief. And suddenly, you see that when they're presented with another option, and these are the ones who have the influence on And we know today, for example, this last intifada was very much on the verge of being a religious intifada. And because of the work we did with the leaders in Al-Aqsa and so on, it was 
taken in other directions, then it could have been much, much, it's still not, you know, there's still, because the issues are still there, but it's not a religious issue anymore. Because we, we dealt with it, both with the rabbis, very much so, a large, large group of rabbis, and with the Islamists. Yeah. Any other questions? Everything's clear? <laughs> But we just say as a former prison chaplain that in prison chaplains we divide the human race into people that are in prison now and people that are not in prison yet. Oh, <laughs> uh, you're talking about politicians. <laughs> Thank you very much, Javi Melchior. I'm going to challenge you lovingly and that is because I loved uh, this lecture very much. I also love the way that you have developed Bishop Stender's idea of peacemaking between religions. You have stepped it up to religions as peacemakers in the political world. And this to me is the most natural and beautiful continuation. Uh, so the challenge, or rather a, a suggestion of, of implementing certain conditions the way you have begun this beautiful lecture with the uh, conditions that Bishop Stendhal is suggesting to us to take up. I think that there are two conditions which are not easy, by the way, to follow, which are um, implied in your ideas, but have not been spelled out and need to be faced, I suggest. The first one being, of course, democracy. You have put peace and democracy together. And rightly so, because we would not like religions to team up making peace, but giving up democracy, for example. This is not a scenario that you or I or anyone here would like to, to share. But then I would like to challenge and add the condition that democracy be understood as a substantive democracy, not only the results of elections. Because if your friends, your Muslim friends, are complaining that the West is being uh, double acting about democracy, saying, well, Hamas was elected democratically, or uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt was elected democratically, and suddenly we are not democrats anymore, we are, we are changing the rules of the game. But of course, uh, the issue is far more complex, because any group elected democratically which proceeds then to eradicate democracy and humanism, has played itself out of the democratic scene. So if Hamas is elected democratically in Gaza, but proceeds then to silence women or minorities or throw homosexuals from the roofs, and it is no longer part of the democratic game, and if we do not understand democracy, we say, yes, they are democratic, they were elected democratically, unless we understand the principles of substantive democracy which allows minorities and human rights. So this is one caveat that I would add. Yes. The second and last condition being, or caveat being, that the two religions involved, we need to uh, engage in some theology of choice, some, what we would call today, selective attitudes, towards their own sources, bringing out, as we said before, the best, but willing to put aside the worst. And so Islam will need to put aside for this purpose the surah of the Quran, which says eradicate all Jews if they are hiding behind rocks and trees and so on and so forth. And Judaism, Jewish leaders will have to rethink some elements in our own sources, in the Bible, in the application of Amalek to present-day conflicts, and what needs to be done with Amalek, and so on and so forth. So these are my two suggestions for very harsh conditions that need to be imposed if the process is to succeed. Both understanding what substantive democracy is, and we need to be selective about some of one's own theological sources. Thank you very much for this. Well, let me just relate to both uh, issues. It's not difficult to relate to them. The, the second issue first, 
I, I don't think that we need to take away sources. I think that both religions have all, all our sources are parts of our sources. The question is which sources are stressed and how we are interpreting them. And we're doing this consistently. We're doing it inside Judaism. There are different interpretations. We have discussions about which sources and how to interpret. That's why we have a, a deep discussion going on, also in the relationship to the other amongst the uh, rabbis and uh, other Jewish scholars. We have a deep discussion going on on these issues on which texts and how and what we should stress amongst the interpretations of the texts. And this is done exactly in the Islam the same way. Well, this is, but we don't know about it, because we never present, never present the best of the other, in, at least in Israel or the Western world as I know it. We always try to find the worst than the other. I, you know, I'm, just now in Denmark. They have in Denmark now, they have a thing because they, they got some sensational recording from some mosque and so on. So they're making a new law now in Denmark, which is generally accepted. And what religious, which texts religious leaders are allowed to use and, not to, and others not allowed to use, and what they're allowed to say. No. They'll be censured. All religious preachers in Denmark. Now the politicians can say exactly the same things. They will not be punished for exactly the same things. They will not. Only the religious leaders. And this is an impossible thing. This is something which you have to reach from an understanding and, and that. And I know that the people I work with on both sides are teaching totally different today than what they were teaching five or ten, ten years ago. And they've gone through this process. Well, this, is, this is to this... I think that this comes through through the process of working actively together on making peace. Only that. Not by somebody telling them that they have to do it. It has to come from themselves. That's number one. On the second issue, I said that. On the second issue, that's exactly what I said that I reacted to them. I explained to them that elections is not just about going and voting and who is the majority, but it's something which is far broader, of which has to do with human dignity and minority rights and so on. And I mentioned this was my other game. I can't, can't give you the whole lecture I gave them. But I want to say to you, that doesn't change the hypocrisy of the Western world. Because if we look, for example, at what happened in Egypt. What happened in Egypt was that the Muslim Brotherhood came to power and they did not they did not do away with civil rights. They did not impose religion as the law of the land. They didn't even do away with the peace with Israel. Everybody knew that if the Muslim Brotherhood would come to power in, in Egypt, that would be the end of peace of the peace treaty with Israel, they didn't do that. And not only that, but there were far more freedoms of press and human rights in that short period when Morsi was the president than any other period which has been in Egypt. So even that argument doesn't hold very well. It doesn't hold very well. That doesn't mean that it's not difficult. But I want to give you an example. This is. This is, I'm saying it's a discussion, it's not black and white. I know that there are people who don't, who don't agree with this inside the Islamic thinking. But look at the Tunisian Enakta party. I don't believe that there is any more democratic people in the world than Ashik Ranushi. I don't know how many of you know of him. He is, you know, he, he leads the Muslim Brotherhood in Tunis. He was the one, he didn't receive the Nobel Peace Prize. There were the four who received now the Nobel He should have had the, got the Nobel Peace Prize. He led a party which won the elections in, in Tunis, and they were, they were killed, they were massacred. 
by Bin Ali. Some of them, tens of thousands were killed. Some of them, like him, managed to go in exile to London. And, and a lot of them were imprisoned. They were sitting 16, 17 years in small cells in prison by Bin Ali's people. Now, this would be the Western world, what the devil would find. They do anything about it? No. Now, he read his philosophy. He says, I believe in Allah and I believe in democracy. The, he lost one election. The day he lost the election, he says, this is the biggest day of my life. I can now truly celebrate democracy. Because it's no big deal to celebrate democracy when you win elections. You celebrate when you lose elections. And when we prove now as opposition that we will work for the government and for the good of all citizen tourists. How many Democrats in any countries in the world do you see write pieces like this and believe in them? Now, this is a model. I know it's not the only model, but this is a model of fundamentalism, of religious fundamentalism and democracy. And they're talking about women's rights and homosexual rights and many other issues. Eh? It's not easy. Also the French Revolution, even the American Revolution, didn't happen overnight. So they, everybody thinks that the Arab uh, the spring, that, if that doesn't happen overnight, you know, uh, French Revolution, uh, they killed quite a lot of people there after the French Revolution, even before Napoleon. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed and then you had to kill people one and one. Not like today when you can murder the lives of so many people at one time. It's not an easy process. We're going towards a world which is much better world. It's, a, it's difficult though. It's much easier when the husband decides at home and you know who decides. You know, it's much easier when there's democracy at home and you need have to respect each other and be placed for each other. It's much more difficult. Much more difficult. What can you do? You know, it's much more easy when you have a dictator who decides and all the others will follow this. And all the, all the, you have upstairs and downstairs. You remember the program in British television, upstairs and downstairs. That was a world we knew. Everything was clear. You had a pyramid. Everything was easier. But that's not the way the world is going. The world is going towards, hopefully, towards a much better and much more fair life. And the religious people are today the most influential people in the world. The religious identity is the strongest identity. And this question which is going on amongst the religious Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, uh, Buddhists, uh, it's just, I don't usually deal with Last week I, I was sitting with all the Eastern religions, so I'm a little influenced by that. But I, it's not something I understand. But, but the, the monotheistic religions are something I understand a little. This is something which is so exciting. And it can go both ways. But let's, let's encourage it. Let's give it a chance, this, this thinking which is going on. Maybe it's enforced by, by Islamic State and, and the, the crazy people in Iran and, and this. Maybe this has forced a lot of this thinking to happen. Yeah. But with both Sheikh Khaledawi and Sheikh Bin Bia, who are the biggest, two biggest authorities of the Islamic world, when they both are now speculating in supporting Israeli-Palestinian peace, then something is happening. Something big is happening. But why not? Then why not give that a chance? The others haven't done too good a job. You know, we've tried that seven, eight times. And it's not that this has been the enormous success, right? I know, I've been a part of it. I said from day one that I thought that, that it was the tragic mistake of Oslo, that, that all the religions were left out. And I was told by all my friends, we'll deal with it afterwards. We'll make a quick fix piece, and then we'll deal with all the important existential questions you're talking about. But it doesn't work like that. The real life doesn't work like that. And therefore, I don't know what will be, if we will be able to have also the full peace and full democracy and full... 
we need to deal with making peace and, and the other components also. If we demand everything as a precondition, then we're not gonna, it's not going to happen. Thank you so much, Rabbi.